friends, it's time for the second hour of Open Line with me, Michael Rydelnik. This is Moody Radio's Bible study across America. We usually talk about your questions about the Bible, God, and the spiritual life. But today is something different. Uh, today we're going to talk about a question that I get all the time on Open Line, but we're talking about it in depth in a pre-recorded program with a special panel. I've got the all-star panel here. I guess some other program talks about all-stars, but no, these are the real all-stars right here. Uh, I've got with me Dr. Mike Van Lanningham, who's an adjunct professor of Bible and theology at Moody Bible Institute. So glad that you are here, Mike. Didn't he have something to do with the Moody Bible commentary? Yeah, he's the co-editor. Oh, yeah, I thought I remembered that. Yeah, he, he was the annoying voice <laughs> in my never, head. I'll never forget it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, and uh, also uh, uh, joining us is Dr. Cisco Cotto. He is a Chicago News Radio anchorman. He's also now assistant professor of pastoral studies at Moody Bible Institute. And also joining us, Eva Rydelnik, uh, the person who usually texts me the answers to the questions. But today, she's right here. She's my wife. Eva teaches adjunct at Moody Bible Institute. And uh, by the way, people always ask me, what does Eva teach? Everything. <laughs> she, there's uh, nothing she couldn't. I'm like teach. The, the utility side guy, you know, jazz band. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you need played, I, yeah. I can play that. Yeah. So, but she, her emphasis is literature and Jewish studies. So, uh, but don't call today. Uh, you can post your questions by going to openlineradio.org. Click on where it says "Ask Michael a Question," fill out the form, and your question will be added to the mailbag for later inclusion. However, today what we're doing is we're talking about the great question people have, can I lose my salvation? And what we did in the first hour was talk about the security of the believer, that we are secure because of what the entire triune Godhead has has secured for us. The Father uh, planned our salvation, the, the Son uh, provided our salvation through his redemption, and the Holy Spirit preserves our salvation with his seal. That's a kind of quick way of looking at what we talked about last hour. Now, what I found is that most people feel, and that's the key word, they feel that somehow they've lost their salvation. And it, it's driven by our feelings. And so... I just got a phone call a couple of days ago from a girlfriend that we've known from back in New York days when we... When we 40 uh, years. 40 years ago. Her. Yeah. Uh, she became a, a follower of Messiah back then, and for the last four decades, she's been plagued by not feeling like she really has a permanent relationship. Yeah. She, whenever something, when her feelings evade her, then that you know, then she starts doubting her salvation. So uh, this is something that that Eva uh, pointed out to me a, a, it's, uh, a bunch of years ago. It, it's an article um, uh, called "Good Days and Bad Days." Maybe you guys can relate to this. I have good days and bad days. On a good day, I can really feel God's love. It's almost tangible. On a good day, I wake up early. I run. I have a meaningful prayer time. I'm in my office writing by 9 o'clock, and I have great ideas. I eat leafy green vegetables. And when I'm offered gooey desserts, I say, no, thank you. I do not watch TV. I feel charitable towards my family and say encouraging things all day long. I'm kind to friends, strangers, and small animals. In the evening, I cook a meal in which nothing burns or is underdone. I wash the dishes and plump the sofa pillows and take a warm bath and put on my clean nighty and fall self-righteously into my bed thinking, of course God loves me. What's not to love? But on a bad day, I wake up late and growl before my eyes are fully open. I figure I've already missed my prayer time, so I scratch it off the list. I'm cross with my husband, my sons, my neighbors, my friends, my salespersons, and people in the traffic are in it, and even innocent children. I gossip about people that I should be praying for. I watch hours of TV and eat potato chips. I do not write a word or move a muscle, and by the time I turn out the light at night, there is only one word to describe me. Yuck. Not only do I not love myself, 
but I find it hard to believe that God, or anyone even remotely associated with heaven, could locate a kind thought to send my way. Those good and bad days demonstrate my skewed expectations of God. I expect him to act like me, to love like I love, to give me what I deserve. And of course he doesn't. On a scale of 1 to 10, God loves me a 10 on my best day and a 10 on my worst. There is no way I can lose God's love by what I do or do not do. There is no way I can improve it by what I do or do not do. There's nothing I can do to make him love me less or love me more. Amazing? You bet it is. It is the best-kept secret of the Christian life, the little understood mystery, which we call amazing grace. That's by by Claire Cloninger. Wonderful little essay, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Uh, Because even though it's written from a woman's perspective, I can make my own list of what a terrible day is like, you know? And I think, I, I know that... I, the thing that amazes me about that is I will doubt that God loves me after a bad day. I never doubt that evil loves me, hmm. you know? And I think I, I am ascribing to Eva greater love than God himself. How stupid is that? Yeah. So yeah, greater perseverance in that love. Yeah. You know, no matter what, she's going to love me. God, I don't know. He, may, he yeah. may change his mind. He may. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I just I, I sometimes just need to read that over and over to kind of remind myself that it's not at all based on my works or my ability to stay secure. It's what we talked about last hour. It's not uh, the perseverance of the saints, but what did you call it, Mike? The preservation of the saints. And for me, I call it the perseverance of the Savior. That's it. Yeah. And, and I'm so encouraged by that. Okay. But we do have to address some other issues. Okay. You mean there are problem issues? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do we do with some of the problem passages? And that's really what we're going to talk about this hour. We talk about, obviously, there are people who believe, love God, love his word, uh, and love Jesus, and they believe we could lose our salvation. So I, I, I recognize that. And so I want to deal with what they would say. But, but, panel, you know, we've got some other opinions here. And uh, I think that uh, what we have are some problem passages. Just as we secured our convictions about this based on the Bible, there are some problem passages. We're going to talk about those. But I want to just talk about some general ways of dealing with problem passages, okay? Uh, And the reason I think of that is I remember coming to Moody Bible Institute as a very snotty teenager, and thinking I knew everything. And I was sitting in the class where the professor was teaching spiritual life, and he taught about the security of the believer, and I raised my hand. And one of the passages we will talk about is Hebrews 6. And I said, well, what about Hebrews 6? And he gave me his explanation of Hebrews 6. And I folded my arms and looked down at the professor in the most condescending way that an 18-year-old can do. And I just kind of said, I just don't think so. (laughs) Uh, And and I kept (laughs) pressing him and pressing him. And... uh, Finally, he said, I'm going to give you something that should help you. Always interpret the unclear passages of Scripture in light of the clear. And it was like, oh, that's the first time I ever heard that. It was like a little light bulb went on. I get it. There's so much clear in Scripture about our security that when I come to a problem passage, I have to know that the Bible is consistent, it's, it's harmonious, it's not like some authors believe you can lose your salvation and other authors believe you can't. So how am I going, I'm going to take the clear teaching of Scripture and then I'll deal with the problem passages in light of that. That to me was one of the helpful things for me for problem passages. Uh, there are a lot of passages, and you mentioned it last hour, that there are passages that deal with the loss of reward. And yet, uh, sometimes we take those as loss of salvation, don't you think? Yeah, I do. Um, but I but I think that we have to be very careful to read the context in situations like that to, to get a really good sense of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want us to start 
and jump into Hebrews chapter well, 6? Well, let's not go to there first. Okay. Well, can I just uh, say one other thing? Yeah. I love what Mike just said about we have to look at the context. Mm-hmm. I think in the idea of taking the unclear passages in light of the clear and also if we take the unclear passages in light of the context, mm-hmm. those two things I think will help us a lot mm-hmm. with some yeah. of these problems. Passages yeah. that people are so stressed. Well, and help us with that. So they, now you're talking about all the surrounding verses, maybe even a few paragraphs around right. there, or even beyond that. You know, mm-hmm. what, what, the, what, what in total is yeah, going on? Yeah, the overall here? teaching of Scripture, the overall character of God. All, mm-hmm. You know, some of Kate, the the big context. I mm-hmm. think it helps us. Not, not any, like you said, not just about this issue, but any issue. Yeah, and we're not we're not there yet. But in Hebrews chapter six, for example, you have to read Hebrews six in light of the entire book of Hebrews. Mm-hmm. Where where it talks about all kinds of things that that really put Hebrews six in its proper place. But if you neglect the entire book of Hebrews, then you're really going to be in trouble. Yeah, you just pull out the isolated warning yeah. passages. Now you're going to be in trouble. Right. You need to understand who the warning passages are being addressed to and what kind of people they are. Um, right. I think that that's that's vital. I'll tell you the other thing is sometimes when we look at problem passages, it's not talking about people. And this relates to Hebrews. It's not talking about people who have lost their salvation. It's people who never really knew the Lord. And right. of course, Matthew seven, yeah, twenty one through twenty three. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. You lost it. No, yeah. what, you depart from me, workers of iniquity. I, I never, never knew, knew you. you. Yeah. Let me just comment on Matthew just for a second. It's very yeah. interesting in Matthew's gospel. You've got you've got an actual category of counterfeit followers of Jesus. You have uh, wise and foolish virgins. You have yeah. righteous and unrighteous slaves. You have wheat and tares. You have those whose house is built upon the rock and those whose house is built upon sand. For for all external purposes, they all look exactly the same. The problem is that they are not. They are not the same. Um, and so um, in the example of the wheat and tares, you know, all of this leads us to think, why should we be surprised when somebody professes to be a Christian and then after a number of, of years or after some time co- continually um, um, live in disobedience to the Lord? Why would we be surprised at that? Because it is actually a category of people in the Gospel of Matthew, who are not true followers, but they sure look like it. Mm-hmm. And I want to suggest that a lot of the people who we think are saved and they lose their salvation, as you said, Michael, were never actually saved to start with. They were tares. They were not wheat. Yeah. Well, they, uh, yeah. Now, that, that, that raises an interesting question because I, I think if people hear that, and I totally agree with you, uh, First John, First John 2.19 uh, they went out from us, but yeah. they did not belong to us, right? I mean, there are people who, who are here hanging out, and they, they sure look like they're believers, but they're not. Uh, but I, I they think when someone us, hears that— They would not have gone out from they us. Would, exactly. They would have stayed, right? Yeah. But when people hear that, sometimes they go, well, then how do I know that I'm really one of them? How do I know that six months, a year, five years down the road, I'm not going to wander off because I'm not really part of the fold? Let's take that up next segment. We're going to break right here. And uh, when we come back, we're talking about how do I know? How can I have some assurance of salvation? That's even before we look at those problem passages. Uh, this is the All Star Panel: Mike Van Lanningham, Cisco Cotto, Eva Rydelnik, and me, Michael Rydelnik. We'll be right back, and we'll try and figure out how we can experience assurance of our salvation. Are you prepared for the earth-shaking events that will unfold when the Messiah Jesus returns? Do you feel confident in your knowledge of what is to come? In The King is Coming, Dr. Erwin Lutzer provides an eye-opening look at 10 future events surrounding the second coming of Jesus. Request your copy of The King is Coming when you give a gift of any amount. Call 888-644-7122 or visit openlineradio.org.
Welcome back to Open Line. My name is Michael Radelnik, and joining me this hour and the previous hour as well, Eva Radelnik, my wife, and also a teacher at Moody Bible Institute, Mike Van Lanning, I'm teaching Bible and Theology at Moody Bible Institute, and Cisco Cotto, Professor of Pastoral Studies at Moody Bible Institute, and we four are discussing the security of the believer. Cisco, you raised something that was so significant. People say, well, how do I know I won't bail? How do I know that I am secure, that I really am a genuine follower of Jesus? What would you say yeah, to how, someone? How can I even know? One of the verses I mentioned in the first hour, I grew up in a, a, a background that really left me in limbo all the time. Am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I good today? Am I bad tomorrow? What, you know, it's just this really bad. Oh, well, you'll know when you get there. Well, I want to find out before I get there. I, I, don't, I don't want to wait. It's too risky. Uh, one of the verses that helped me from childhood on, it, j- just because it laid out the fact that I can know that, that I'm saved, is 1 John 5.13, where he says, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not so that you can wonder, not so that you can hope, not so that maybe, but so you can actually know and then what that did is it not only provided me some encouragement, it also said, oh, now let me continue to search the scriptures or let me continue sort of, sort of processing this with the Lord. If I can know, uh, then then how do I know? And that's when all the scriptures we've been talking about were, were brought to my attention. And I said, oh, I can confidently know this. That was exactly the verse I was going to talk about because uh, when I worked with Campus Life a zillion years ago, this was a big question that a lot of st- students that I worked with had. And I said – this We all memorize this verse together. And I said, these things have I written to you that you may know. Well, you have to know what's written in order to really reap the benefit of the security. So it yeah. just drives you right back to the word. And yet the encouragement is you can know. You can know. For me, that was just yeah. – as, as a young person, that was just eye-opening. I, I can actually know for sure that I have eternal life. Yes, you can. Mm-hmm. It's interesting too. I mean in that verse in First John – uh, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of Son God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Well, what did you write in First John? Well, here's the things that he wrote. Do you love God? Do you love his commandments? Do you love Christian people? You know, and so, and the and the suggestion is, is that if you do, then and, and you're believing in Christ, you have to believe in the name of the Son of God. Those are evidences and, and proofs that you are right with God through faith in Christ. And so you you even see how those uh, proofs are there in First John that can reassure us that we really are Christians. Do I think it's so interesting is that a lot of people say, "But I still sin." But same author, First John, he says, "You know, walk in the light as he is in the light, right. and we'll have fellowship. God and us will have fellowship together." Uh, and if anyone sins, sins, we have an advocate in the, in the uh, Son. Yeah, and he doesn't deny that we sin. He says, in fact, if we deny that we sin, then we're making God a liar. Right. But we confess our sin, and we then are assured that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sins. And so that's First John 1. I think that's so interesting that he never says we lose our relationship with God when we sin. Uh, we might break fellowship with him, right. but the confession restores that. So. Yeah, he's writing this first John. Obviously, he's writing to believers, yeah. right? And he so he even says that Mike just read the verse. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. He's writing to Christians who may be doubting whether or not they have eternal <laughs> life. So we we come from a long line of doubters. Yeah, yeah. There, <laughs> there were there were a group of people from that church who had withdrawn. You know, they went out from us and in the case they weren't of us. They'd, they'd gone out from them, and they were saying about those people who stayed in the church, you guys are all messed up. You, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not right with God, blah, 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 blah. And so John, among other things, is writing to them to reassure them that they are right with God, and he uses these evidences that if believe if people who profess to know Christ um, and truly know him, and if they have those evidences, that's reassurance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, now I think that we can... Use this as a great foundation to talk about. Take a breath and say, breath. yeah, I we're don't talk, need to worry. We're mm-hmm. going to talk about some problem passages, okay? And the number one problem passage that I get, there's actually two uh, top passages, and so I want to talk about both of them. Let's deal with the, the easy, uh, what I think is the easier one first. Uh, that's, uh, there's Hebrews 6 and Matthew 12. People call all the time, 
first of all, with Matthew 12, have I committed the unpardonable sin? That sure, all the other sins can be forgiven, but have I committed the unpardonable sin? And that, uh, I'm going to turn over here, you can hear all our pages turning, to (laughs) to Matthew chapter 12, when this is what the Lord Jesus says. Uh, He says, well, this is when the Pharisees, the religious leadership, they said in verse 24, this man drives out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Knowing their thoughts, he told them, every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I drive out demons by Beelzebub, Uh, this is so important. Who is it uh, your sons drive out demons by? If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. But then uh, he's... uh, I'm going to jump down to verse 31. Because of this, I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy. But the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the blasphemy against the Spirit, will not be forgiven. The unpardonable sin blaspheming the Holy Spirit. How do we know if we've blasphemed the Holy Spirit? And does it mean that we can never be forgiven? Even if we were saved, if we commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, will we lose our salvation? Okay, the reason I read the whole context is this is one of those cases where context really helps us. Absolutely. So let me just start off by saying People tend to think that uh, lack of faith in Christ for salvation is the unpardonable sin. The problem is that every one of us who have trusted Christ and Savior at one point were in a state of unbelief. And that's obviously not the unpardonable sin, otherwise we wouldn't be forgiven. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that. When a person dies in a state of unbelief, it's not so much the unpardonable sin, it's the unpardoned sin. Mm -hmm. Anybody who comes to Christ finds forgiveness. So it's not faith. I think what we actually have here is what the passage says, ascribing to Jesus uh, and through the Spirit, the works, uh, ascribing to him um, satanic complicity, that is, that he's in, mm. he's in, he's, um, in, in compliance with and working with um, the devil. It's so interesting to me. I don't believe that we can actually commit this sin today. I don't think the conditions are right that suggest that we could do it. Because it seems to me, Mike, that you have to have the incarnate Messiah before us to claim that he's doing his works by Satan. Exactly. He has to be there. And they had a maximal amount of light that we do not have. Mm -hmm. But Jesus was there. He was doing these miraculous things. But it is interesting. He says in verse 32... Um, anybody who speaks against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. And the age to come is not heaven. It's the millennial kingdom when Jesus will again be physically present, performing miracles. And again, apparently, there will be people who will at that time ascribe to him satanic complicity. They're not mm. going to be forgiven. But the conditions are not right for us to be able to commit that sin now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting, as I, I wrote this in Today in the Word in the Q&A section once, I never have gotten such angry notes back. It's like people want to be able to commit the unpardonable wow. sin. I just thought that was amazing. Or do they want to be able to ascribe it to others? Exactly. Well, yeah, I think that. <laughs> Sometimes there's that, too. Sometimes there's that. That's it, yeah. But I, yeah, that's, I think, what it is. is yeah. I, I would never commit the unpardonable sin, but you, Cisco. That's yeah, right. I definitely think I've you. seen it time and again. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I think that's, there's a lot of truth to that. So I think, I think that just sort of dismisses it, that it's not something that we can commit today. Now, I will say this. That I do think what the religious leadership was doing is they were rejecting Jesus. No question. Yeah. Right. That they, up until then, they, they had no faith, but they were coming to a place of full, final rejection. Now, I think it's possible for people that we talk to today, they can come to a place of full, final rejection. I'll tell you the difference is I think Jesus knew when they had come to full, final rejection. Right. I don't. We don't. Yeah. So I can I can kill I can still keep presenting the good news to everyone 
And you know what? I, I've seen people who have rejected and rejected. And I would have, on my knowledge, said, oh, this person. They'll never. They'll never believe. And then something happens. And all of a sudden, the hardest heart becomes tender and they respond. Mm. So that's why I never give up on people. Uh, if I were, if I knew the Lord, if I, if I was the Lord and knew their hearts, then maybe. But I'm not. And so I'm going to trust God and I'm going to keep praying for those hard hearts. But nevertheless, this is not a sin that we can commit today. That's the key thing that I wanted to, to go over. Okay, we're going to come back with Hebrews 6, uh, one of the toughest passages for us. So stay right there. We're coming right back to discuss that. We're so glad that FEBC partners with Open Line with Dr. Michael Radonik, bringing the FEBC mailbag every week. Learn how Far East Broadcasting Company is taking Christ to the world at febc.org. On their weekly podcast, Until All Have Heard with Ed Cannon, you'll hear stories of lives changed by Messiah all across the globe. Again, you can hear the podcast when you visit febc.org. That's febc.org. Welcome back to Open Line with Michael Rydelnik. Uh, we've got the all-star panel here, all my friends who are uh, talking about the security of the believer. We're going to talk about Hebrews 6 in just a moment. But recently someone wrote to Open Line. This is what they said. My husband and I love tuning into Open Line on Saturday mornings. The Lord has used you to spur us on in knowledge and having a sound mind as we live life for his glory. We appreciate you. And then they told me that they just became kitchen table partners. I just like, well, first of all, I really liked what they said. But nevertheless, <laughs> I, I appreciate so much that they became kitchen table partners. I'm grateful for all our listeners, everyone that listens, and especially because I always thought the only person that would ever listen to Open Line was Eva. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful for everyone that listens, but especially those of you who uh, generously give to Open Line on a monthly basis because you want to keep this program on the air. Appreciate it so much. One of the things I'd like to do if you do become a Kitchen Table partner, and that's what I do for everyone, is every other week I prepare a special audio Bible study exclusively for our Kitchen Table partners. It comes in the mail. Click on it. Listen to it for a few minutes, and hopefully the Word will encourage you as, we, as, as I send it to you every other week. If you'd like to become a Kitchen Table partner or you're thinking about it, all you have to do is call 888 644 7122. That's 888 644 7122. Or you can go to openlineradio.org. And now we're going to talk about Hebrews 6, which you know, when I read that the first time, I thought for sure I could lose my salvation. So let me just read verses 4 through 6. And then, Mike, you set this up, and then we'll all kind of contribute a little bit about this, okay? Uh, Hebrews 6, here the page is turning once again. Hebrews 6. Verses 4 through 6. Okay, here we go. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. That's a hard verse. So, Again, one of the things we have to keep in mind is what's going on in the broader context of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews has a bunch of warning passages, chapter 2, chapter 3, 4, uh, the end of chapter 5, first part of chapter 6, chapter 10. And I think what's happening here is that there's an aspect of this messianic group, almost certainly a messianic group, who had come to Christ legitimately and had found salvation, but I would put it in sort of terms more fitting for Hebrews, and they have found covenantal perfection in Christ, the salvation he offers. Uh, but there were some who had become associated with this group, were well taught, had maybe even seen miracles by the Spirit in this group, but we're in the process of sort of reconsidering and going back into their Judaism without their Messiah, Jesus. 
Um, and, and so those warning passages are especially addressed to them. Don't go, don't go away from Jesus. You need to hang on to him. And if they didn't, that would be evidence of the fact that they were not really saved to start with. Uh, two passages I want to read, and then Michael has a great explanation of Hebrews 6. But in, in um, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, Christ was faithful as a son over uh, God's house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence in the boast and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Now, we are members of God's household. If And the proof of that is that we hold firm our confidence in Christ and our faith in Christ. And so those who have true faith in Christ will persevere. And it's even clearer, I think, in chapter 3, verse 14. It says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. That is, if we stay in faith with Christ, that is an evidence and a proof of the fact that we are partakers with him. The problem is, the people who were reading these warning passages, and it was those who, that were addressed, uh, were being addressed in those warning passages, were in the process of withdrawing, and that would be a disastrous thing. And so, I, uh, so uh, the, the people needed to go all the way to Christ. They needed to let go of uh, the priesthood of Aaron. Uh, they needed to let go of Moses and the law. They needed to let go of the old covenant and the earthly tabernacle and temple, and they needed to come all the way to everything perfect found in Christ. And they hadn't done that, some of them. Yeah, uh, here's what, uh, 3.14, we have become partakers of Christ or Messiah if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. We have not become partakers of him if we have not if we don't hold fast to the end. Right. I think that that's so important. Uh, I had a professor at seminary now with the Lord, Stan Toussaint, used to say, the proof of election is perseverance. Right. Uh, and... And that, that's so crucial for seeing that, that he doesn't know yet whether they're going to persevere. Uh, he does say this in Hebrews 4, uh, Let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Seems like there are some people there that have come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us just as they also but the word they heard did not profit them. It's referring to people who were in the wilderness because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So what is he saying? He's saying there's some of you here, I don't know, but do you have genuine faith? Uh, it's possible that you've come short of really putting your trust in Jesus. And that's really important that we get it. And I think when we come to Hebrews 6 and you look at the opening verses, he says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Messiah... Let us press on to maturity. A lot of people think he's saying, let's leave the foundational teachings that you received when you first came to faith. But he would never tell us to leave that. No. Uh, instead, what it sounds like what he's saying is, you need to leave an Old Testament faith, which you had, and move to a New Testament faith. Now, if you look at the six things he tells them to move on from, okay, each of them... Five of the six could be either an Old Testament teaching or a New Testament teaching. But one is absolutely an Old Testament, and therefore we know he's talking about moving from an Old Testament faith to a New Testament faith, from faith without Jesus to faith in Jesus, okay? Here's why I say that. He says over here uh, that what we have to do, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, was there repentance in the Old Testament? Yes. Uh, faith toward God? Yes. Uh, instruction about washings, let's leave that off. Laying on of hands, that we have that both old and new. Resurrection of the dead, old and new. Eternal judgment, old and new. Both of the, All those are old, same. The, the one difference is where it says instructions about washing, some versions say about baptism. The word that's used in Greek is not the word for believer baptism in the New Testament. It is the word for Old Testament washings, which is the root of New Testament uh, baptism. But it is specific. It is the word for ritual washings from the book of Exodus and Leviticus and places like that. It is so crucial that he says this. So what he's saying is, leave that Old Testament faith and move on to a full faith in the coming. The Old Testament is saying he's coming, the Messiah is coming. 
but now he's here. You have to enter into a full faith in the Messiah. That's what's so significant about this. And uh, now, so it's, it does, yeah. it's not saying the Old Testament is bad. No. It's saying the Old Testament is pointing toward Messiah. Messiah is here, so now you need to believe in him exactly. and to see that he is the fulfillment like the, of all like, the Old not Testament. Not like the Old said. Testament, oh, that was bad. Now we're going to go to the good stuff. No, you, you have to move on from the instruction to to the reality, the shadow to the reality. And I'll come back to you, Michael, in just a second. I mean, yeah. what, what you just said in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10, it talks about washings. Same word that we have in Hebrews 6 but in Hebrews 9.10, it's, uh, in, it's related to the Old Testament rites of various kinds of washings. And so yeah. clearly it's, that's, that word is talking about Old Testament um, lustration rites. Yeah, which is why the, the New American Standard, the official version of Eva Rydelnik, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it has the word washings in it, whereas I think the King James actually has baptisms. Baptisms, right. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. yeah. So I think that's crucial. But now, Mike, uh, this is so crucial, or, or Cisco, or anyone that wants to answer this, uh, let's talk about, it describes their experience in verses 4 through 6. It says, they've been enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and been mar- made partakers of the Holy Spirit. What is that talking about if it doesn't mean that they've become believers? Well, let me let me throw another question at you. Yeah. I always like answering your questions with questions. Oh, good. <laughs> it goes must well. be Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess not. Okay. If we have uh, in, in Hebrews what, what essentially sure seems like a sermon, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it sure seems like it's written that way. Um, could this be used by God as an encouragement, a prodding, an exhortation to these believers not to wander off, mm-hmm. you know, sort of saying, hey, hey, stay here. Hey, hey don't, don't go back to your old way. Stay here. And I don't think we can leave it there because then you don't want God to deceive these people into thinking that somehow, you know, they can, they can wander off as believers. And yet I do wonder if this is a way that God exhorts these believers, hey, hey, don't go back to the old ways. Stay here. Keep, keep focused on Christ. Jesus is better than all of that other stuff. Uh, and, and so maybe he's using that in this way in, these, in this I think it, I think that's absolutely what he's doing because what he says in verse 9, after this warning, he says, but beloved, which proves it's a sermon because that's what you call people in sermons. <laughs> beloved. Uh, but beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you things that accompany salvation. What he is saying is, I've given you this warning, but I don't believe it fits you. You're going to stick with this. We expect you to believe. If you're thinking about abandoning the faith, well, maybe I've got doubts about you, but we're convinced of better things concerning you. I think that's really important that we remember that. Okay, so let's talk about what does it mean to be enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and all that. Right. Um, the word enlightened is interesting. A lot of people would say, well, see, they're saved. They're saved. They're enlightened. But in John chapter 1, it talks about uh, the coming of Jesus. I think it's Jesus and his presence enlightens every man. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't mean that every man is saved, but because of the presence of Christ, there's a certain kind of level of enlightening that everybody has. We have a better understanding of God. And so the enlightenment is not necessarily an indication of salvation. Also, it says that um, they've tasted of the heavenly gift um, and been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Well, tasted is used in Hebrews chapter 2 for Jesus who tasted death for us. Now, he really died But please note, it wasn't permanent. He didn't stay dead. And so it's possible here that these people have tasted in some kind of a superficial, temporary, not permanent sort of sense of the heavenly gift. Um, They've been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus is said earlier in the book of Hebrews to have been a partaker of, of human nature. And yet his humanity, while he was fully human, it's also very different from ours. He he doesn't have a sin nature. He was virgin conceived and born. And so while he's a partaker of humanity, his humanity is nevertheless different from ours. And so I would suggest that here the partakers of the Holy Spirit uh, are not necessarily full-blown partners of the Holy Spirit or possessors of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you can, you can go through it, all it, of these different things, and they're not necessarily an indication of full salvation. They've tasted of the powers of the age to come. They've sat under the, in the community of believers. They've experienced 
all these good things. Right. But I, I call it the close but no cigar. Yes. You know, yeah. they, they've come very close, but they really haven't. Potentially, they, if they abandon it, it proves they've not experienced it themselves. But when it says that they can't be renewed again to repentance, I would say, humanly speaking, once they come close and then abandon, they can't be renewed to repentance. Uh, I, but I never know when someone's come to that place. And right. so I'm going to leave that up to God. I'm going to keep encouraging people. If I know someone that's come close and then abandon the faith, I'm going to try and not give up on them, but keep trusting God for that. So uh, well, I hope that helps you with your understanding of Hebrews 6. We're going to come back and deal with, real quickly with a whole bunch of other problem passages. This is the all-star panel of Cisco Cotto, Mike Van Lanningham, Eva Rydelnik, and me. I'm trying to help keep everyone here on, on target, so that's what my role is. Uh, we're talking about security of the believer. Come right back. We're going to talk about it further. People often call or write with questions about the Jewish people, and particularly they want to know how to share their faith with their Jewish friends. One of the best ways to do that is to help your friends understand the marvelous prophecy of the Messiah found in Isaiah 53. Chosen People Ministries wants to help you. They're offering open line listeners a free book called Isaiah 53 Explained. As you read this book, you'll get a better grasp of this pivotal passage in the Jewish Bible, and you'll be able to share its remarkable truths with your Jewish friends. Or you can pass it on to your Jewish friend to read for her or himself. To get your free copy of Isaiah 53 Explained, go to the Open Line website, that's openlineradio.org. Scroll down, and you'll see a link that says, A Free Gift from Chosen People Ministries. Click on that, and you'll be taken to a page where you can sign up for your own copy of Isaiah 53 Explained. Welcome back to Open Line. I'm Michael Rydelnik, and I, right at the outset, this has uh, been a great day for me. I've had Cisco Cotto, a professor at Moody, joining me to talk about Security of the Believer, Mike Van Lanningham, adjunct professor of Bible and theology at Moody. Eva Rydelnik teaches literature and Jewish studies at Moody. Thanks so much, guys, for That's joining me. That's been great for yeah. We've yeah. had a good time. Yeah. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And... Uh, I just want to hit a, a couple of real quickly about some of the problem passages. Uh, sometimes people really find John fifteen six troublesome, Michael, don't you think? Yes, and uh, I can see why. It says, uh, well, you, you go ahead and read it if you want. Okay. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So it's interesting that in verse 2, it says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. In verse 6, it's the fruitless branches who are taken away and burned. And it's very interesting to me that in verse 16, Jesus chooses us to bear fruit. He says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So Christ chose us to bear fruit. The fruitless branches are not chosen by him. That is, fruitless believers were not chosen by him, because it's his purpose that they would bear fruit. And if we abide in him, uh, and I think that's a reference to salvation, then we will bear fruit. And if you don't, then you are burned and you will face judgment. But this is talking about that group of people who look like they're associated with Jesus, but they're not. They are not truly safe. A, sim- they were, a simple they way of looking fruit. at it is abiding is someone who believes. Yes. That's it. That's it. And someone who doesn't abide is someone who never believed. And Honestly. they're fruitless, right? And they're fruitless, right. Okay, so here's another verse uh, that I think people find troublesome is Hebrews 10.26 and following. And the reason they find it troublesome is they're afraid that this is them. They say, uh, if we deliberately sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of the fire about to consume the adversaries. Basically, what this is saying 
they think is if I sin one time, I'm done for. I've come to the Lord, everything's forgiven, and now I'm done for. But I don't believe that. I think the deliberate sin is having, just like in Hebrews 6 and uh, the, the whole picture here of Hebrews 6, is having been part of the community of faith of being so close and now commit the sin of absolute rejection of Jesus and abandoning him. If we commit that particular sin, then the, the expectation is that we will face judgment. Hey, Eva, why don't you close us off with something to encourage us? Okay, I think Jude uh, verse 24 is especially encouraging because we're worrying about what can we do that's going to prevent us from having this relationship. Jude 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus the Messiah our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So whose responsibility is bringing us into the kingdom? It's not my good stuff, not my good deeds. It doesn't depend on me. It's him, God the Father, who is able to keep you from stumbling. Yeah. The only God, our Savior, through Messiah Jesus, our Lord. And he'll present us blameless before the throne, not because we are blameless, but because Jesus is blameless. How good is that? Hey, friends, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, Mike... Cisco, Eva, I appreciate it so much. Thanks, Tricia and Courtney. Great job today. Really helpful. And remember, keep in touch with Open Line during the week. You can check out our webpage, openlineradio.org. That page has everything you need if you're looking for it, particularly if you want to know what our current resource is and how to become a kitchen table partner. That's a great place to look. Also, you can check out my personal webpage if you're interested in that. Keep reading the Bible. We'll talk about it next week. Open Line with Dr. Michael Rydelnik is a production of Moody Radio, a ministry of Moody Bible Institute. Have a great weekend. See you next week.